Welcome to our uh, Muslim Neighbors once again. You know, as we do the show more and more, it's clear to me that Muslims throughout the world have families. They have hopes and dreams and desires. They have uh, struggles just like everybody else. And when our wrists are cut, we all bleed red blood. We're trying at Telecare to take some time to listen to what's happening in the Muslim community so that we might not only understand each other, but befriend each other. Uh, so many of you have written in appreciation of the show, and we deeply appreciate that. Uh, Rabbi Gelman has pneumonia, so he won't be on the show today. Even rabbis need a day off. But joining us for the show today is Maysoon Zaid. She's an actress, an activist, and the first female Muslim comedian in America. Welcome, Maysoon. Thank you so much for having me, Father Tom. You know what I notice that when people become more and more a part of the culture of another country, they then bring to that country certain talents that they have, they develop in certain areas. Now, you have the, the talent of being a comedian. It's, it's been interesting being a Muslim comedian in the United States post 9-11 because really it's a combination of the history of the Palestinian and Muslim community combined with the history of the American oppressed community because comedy is the voice of the oppressed. When comedy was first getting really big, it was the African-American comics who were talking about being oppressed, and then you had people like Lenny Bruce who politically felt oppressed, and that became their voice. That became the way that they were able to express themselves. So as someone who was in a country where right now I felt, even though I was born and raised here, a lot of oppression, a lot of racism towards me and my culture and the people that are part of my community, I felt like comedy was the perfect voice for it. Now, comedy is that voice. But so many people come up to me and they say, my impression is that it would be surprising that a woman would be a comedian, that maybe the community would keep her from doing that. But obviously that's not the case. Well, it's been very interesting because my father, my father, Musa Zayed, is a hajj. He's been to pilgrimage. He is, you know, a devout Muslim. We are a Muslim family. And he's extremely proud of the work that I'm doing because he feels like it's part of my mission on earth to go out there and educate people about Islam in a way that's comfortable and fun for them. So he's really proud of what I'm doing because he sees all the great feedback that I get from the community. And yes, in the beginning, he was worried. He was really worried in the beginning, but he's had so much positive feedback from so many great people within the community and from newspapers and television that he's, he's really happy with it. Now, when you do your comedy, do you have to uh, be aware of certain things, like would an American audience react differently than, say, a uh, Mideastern audience? I think as an entertainer, I have an internal gauge of what works and what doesn't and where. Like when people walk out or they fall asleep. I or... kind of love when people walk out. I do. I really do love it. <laughs> yeah, I do. I like getting a reaction. I'm a very edgy, edgy comic, and there's nothing off limits. So do, nothing you, for do me. you take them on as they're walking out? Or? No. I don't take them on because it's not about that, because then the show becomes about them, and you neglect the rest of the audience and just put your focus completely on them. I mean, I had a table of 14 people stand up and leave um, on my first line, because I start off by saying I'm a Palestinian Muslim and continue and talk about my cerebral palsy. Before I even got the word Muslim out of my mouth, the entire, entire table stood up and left. Wow. So it's just... That kind of tempers the audience to go, whoa, we're seeing something really different here. If this many people, before she even says her name, are leaving, <laughs> you know, it's got to be something. But in general, the reaction has been fantastic. And I've done shows in Toledo and Kentucky and Georgia. Now, you do your in. homework. You actually go to Palestine and, and uh, work with children. I do. I, uh, I run a four-month art program for disabled, wounded, and orphaned refugee children in Palestine every single year. Oh, that is great. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky because, thank God, my comedy is going really well. So from the earnings of my comedy, I go back each year and work with these kids. You know, I can't imagine what it's like to, to um, raise children in an environment where their, their lives are threatened. 
Well, it's interesting because I've been doing this now for four years. So I was there during the height of the Intifada, and now I'm there at the height of the building of the you know, separation wall. And I watch the effects that it has on their health, on their, men on their mental stability, on their psychology. And it's, it's really just the disability almost becomes the least of the problems compared to the emotional um, condition of these children. Our crew caught up with another leading Muslim comic at his performance in Long Island. Based in Chicago, Azir Usman, who travels nationwide with his act, knows how to turn fear into funny. Let's take a look. We can't win with the media, man, because everything they write about Arabs or Muslims has got to have something to do with violence, you know? Like if the show up here tonight wrote an article about me, they'd be like, Muslim comic bombs. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. And I can't win, because even if I do well, they'd be like, Muslim comic kills! Audience explodes with laughter. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I, I gotta be honest with you. Let let's have some honesty tonight. Part of the problem is our community. Okay? We got more than our fair share of wackos, man. Make no mistake about it. We give the media plenty old material. You guys remember when the sniper thing was going on in D.C.? Right? All the psychological profilers were like, this suspect is a white male, Caucasian, middle-aged, dejected from society. And all of us were secretly like, arrest this guy already, man. Show the world that we're not the only ones with wackos. And there I was watching the news, head nicely, and then sniper has been caught. I'm like, yes. His name is John. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Alan? All right. Muhammad! <laughs> Thank you very much, Brother Johnny. Exactly what we need, a Muslim sniper. You know, when you can laugh at things like that, it, it engages people in discussion, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a step forward. Before we started the show, you told me about a story of children in the Palestinian area who needed glasses. Well, I was teaching in the refugee camps, and, you know, the side note is, really, I'm just a stand-up comic. I have no idea why I do this. I just do. <laughs> and uh, I was there with my friend, Suhair Hamad, a wonderful poet, and we noticed none of the kids, none of the kids had glasses. And we're like, none of these children have glasses. That's unusual. And it can't be because they don't need them. So this winter, when I went back, I hired a wonderful, amazing um, doctor, Brother Khalil, and he came in and tested the eyes of all the kids, and we brought back the prescriptions, and we're filling them out now, and I'm going back, inshallah, February 12th to give out the glasses. You know, one of the aspects of the Muslim faith is charity, and it's, it's well ensconced in the religion, and, that, and it's, it exists in Christianity, it exists in Judaism. We all share the, that dimension to it. You also do radio work. I do. I, I have a show on WBAI radio, um, the first Tuesday of every month called Fen Majnoon with Dean and Maysoon. And it's kind of a political comedy show, which we also um, interview Arab artists. And I host that show with my, my great friend and brother, Dean Obidala, who also is the executive producer with me of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. And the New York Arab American Comedy Festival is kind of like, it's our jihad, it's our baby. You know, it's our goal to really mainstream Muslim artists and Muslim, you know, Arab talent into the entertainment industry and show the amazing caliber of talent that we have. And this past festival, we had 40 artists all wow. doing comedy, all doing, you know, really light, happy comedy. And it was, it was just fantastic. We had Tony nominees. We had people with television shows. And it really, just by having all those people in one room, it was so empowering for the community. All right. When we return on Our Muslim Neighbors, we will be joined by the author of a new play called Taxi to Jana. The play has won first, second, and third awards, respectively, in three recent national playwriting competitions. We'll learn about all about it when we return, so stay with us on Our Muslim Neighbors. Muslims are telling their story through different media. Let's shift gears slightly and talk with the writer who wanted to tell the American Muslim story from his outsider's perspective. 
Joining us in the studio now is Mark Sickman, author of the play Taxi to Jenna. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much. Now, you have a Catholic background, yet yes. you're writing about the Muslims. Whatever led you to do that? Uh, I, know, I know a lot of Muslims, and uh, casual acquaintances, good friends, and I've always found these people to be hardworking and optimistic and have a great sense of humor. And uh, I always thought it was fun to, to walk into that convenience store or to visit that doctor and, and, and just to enjoy that experience of, uh, of, of being with a Muslim. I was bothered by the images that I saw on TV. And as a writer, I thought uh, maybe this is the subject for a play, mm -hmm. a play with uh, a Muslim hero, preferably a comedy. And uh, so I wrote it. I began work on this about four years ago. And uh, it has come to fruition now and is being produced in New York at a very fine theater. Now, 9-11 came along. Did that in any way change your plans? That knocked it completely off the table. Yeah, I had a small production lined up uh, for the play, and uh, after 9-11, the producer called me and said, it's just too touchy, it's just too sensitive a subject, uh, we're going to have to cancel that. And, of course, uh, that's, that's very discouraging to a writer to have something like oh, that happen. Sure. And uh, especially since theaters are supposed to take chances and, and be daring. But I'm happy to say that after about six months, the dust kind of settled, and yeah. all of it a sudden does. there was a tremendous appetite for this sort of thing. Consequently, it's, it's progressed since then. So tell us about the actual a Taxi to Jenna. It's a comedy, and uh, it's about a taxi driver in a large American city. It could be New York, it could be St. Louis, it could be Los Angeles. And this taxi driver is a good man, a good guy. Mm. He's got a great sense of humor, a lot of wit, and he loves bantering with his passengers. Consequently, in the, in the course of the play, he interacts with people from all faiths, all cultures, uh, all, all walks of life, and he has an influence on them. He has a personal mission uh, in the play, and uh, his personal mission is to establish a small storefront mosque as an outreach program. Mm. And he selects an, an abandoned Baptist church in, uh, in which to uh, attempt this endeavor. And what happens in the play is that he is simultaneously hauling passengers all over town, working hard, interacting with them, and at the same time trying to realize his dream of, of founding this mosque. He runs into every conceivable problem you can imagine. The building department, uh, an, an unsympathetic wife, uh, all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. and. He eventually triumphs in the end, and the reason that he triumphs is because he's won the support of all these people that he's encountered in the course of the play. You know, it's, it's wonderful to meet a person who has found a passion, mm -hmm. and that passion, if it's translated into compassion, becomes very powerful in yes. making a difference in the world. That is correct. What helped you spiritually in writing this book, this play? I think that to the single biggest thing was that I, I reached out to the Muslim community and pretty much threw myself uh, at their mercy because I didn't know that much about, about Islam. And I befriended a, a very wonderful man, Sheikh Ahmed Dawidar, who's the imam at the uh, Islamic Center on, on uh, 55th Street in Manhattan. And he read the initial script and he he liked it right away. He got it. He's, he's a very intelligent fellow, and he got it. And he's given me all this support for the last couple of years just in consulting on the script and giving me introductions to the, to the Muslim community. So I think that's the most gratifying thing, that the Muslim community seems to have accepted and embraced this thing. And that is all in the, in the person of uh, Sheikh Ahmed. I mentioned earlier that Rabbi Gelman has pneumonia. You may want to say a prayer for him that he speedily recover. But one of the things that we've found in the God Squad is that if you just have the courage to walk across the street and, and do exactly what Mark did, and that is talk with somebody, uh, particularly if you have a feeling about the, the Muslim community and you're not sure, ask them and chat with them and get to know them. So it's not a we, they, but it becomes an us. Exactly. That's the challenge. Now, when can somebody see your play? 
It's running in Queens at Queens Theater in the Park, uh, February 3rd through 6th. And then it moves to Manhattan to a beautiful little theater, 59 East 59. And that is February 8 through 20. So it's a co-production of Queens Theater in the Park and 59 East 59. In, in terms of our audience, from what you've learned from a Catholic perspective, mm -hmm. what would you say about or want to sh share with them about the Muslim community? I would say that you have to judge each person as an individual. Now, now that, that may sound corny. <clears throat> no, that makes but, sense. Uh, but that's the whole purpose of what I've written. The idea of judging each person as an individual uh, uh, and not in the context of, 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 of some group they might belong to, some social strata they might be from, some religion or, 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 court, or cultural uh, area that they might be from. If you can just judge every person as an individual by the good that they do, I think you're going to find that there are wonderful, wonderful people in, in, in the Muslim community. I like that. When we return, a member from the trio they call themselves Native Dean will join us. They're part of a new musical phenomenon known as Muslim rap, which strikes a chord, especially with African Americans, who make up about a third of all the Muslims in the United States. So stay with us as we learn more about this emerging genre, Muslim rap. and interested in their faith. It's one of the things I'm learning about sitting and chatting with the American Muslim community. So welcome back. We've been exploring how American Muslims are impacting the performing arts. We're going to take a look now at how they're making music their own. Joining us in the studio now is Joshua Salam, the leader of the Muslim rap group known as Native Dean. He's not only locally known, nationally known, he's internationally known. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, how in the world, when I think of Muslim and I think of rap, I don't think of the two words together. Right. How in the world did you do it? Well, I mean, the three of us, uh, you know, kind of were raised in the inner city from different areas. One was raised in Baltimore. I was raised in Missouri. And that was just a common thing, just like basketball, soccer, you know, whatever, something that the youth did. So for us, it was just a natural thing that we were doing. But because we were raised Muslim, that's what we rapped about. And it became very popular in the Muslim community, and then it just kind of grew from there, and we made a name for ourselves. What is Muslim rap? How would you define it for somebody who is used to uh, an orchestra or rock and roll music? Right. Well, rap, when, just when you say rap, right. a lot of times has a negative connotation to it. So, but, but really, it's just an art form, and that's why they have this thing of you know hardcore rap and gangster rap and you know, things like that. So when you say Muslim rap, it's really, uh, you know, uh, some people just say it's an, a Muslim artist who's rapping, but for us it means more of uh, Muslims who are using this art form to talk about their faith, so that the lyrics and the message is more uh, Islamically based and talks about our faith and our lifestyle, and things like that, our struggles. Now, is there some sort of distinction between using drums and wind instruments? Yeah, there's a, uh, um, you know, a large group uh, uh, a large opinion, I should say, in, in the religion where uh, wind and string instruments are considered uh, forbidden. And then uh, some say that uh, some drum instruments are not allowed also. So we've tried to take a middle path to use only percussion instruments because our goal is just not to get out there and do whatever we want. We really want as many people listening to our message as possible. So we, you know, although we may not hold that opinion, but because we're trying to get our message out there. We don't use wind string instruments. We use a lot of percussion, drums, and different things like that. Joshua, I mentioned to you before our segment that I had been doing a show, a rock show, mm -hmm. on WBAB, and then continue that. I play rock songs and tell stories in between, right. moral stories, education stories. And then I went to ABC on four of their networks and did that for about another 15 years. Right. So I really believe that every third song could be a prayer to God. Mm -hmm. In terms of yourself, when, when you're looking to write a song or play a song, what do you look for so that it qualifies to be Muslim rap? It's not hard at all, actually, uh, because for us, every song that we write is just, 
it's because Islam is not just something that we do one day of the week. It's like every, it's a lifestyle, you know. As you know, a lot of people of faith, when they get up, they're thinking about their religion before they eat, before they go to sleep, when they in interact with people. And so, you know, and with us, we're not necessarily youth anymore, but we just came out of our, our youth and we had so many, uh, you know, ideas, problems that are going on, problems in the Muslim world, problems in our community. And since this was how we expressed ourselves, some people drew art, some people wrote poems, but we always sang about it. So it wasn't, I mean, I was just talking with a young lady not too long ago, and she was telling me about the problems in her community. So I wrote a song called Paradise, and it talks about uh, reminding the youth that paradise is for those who are, you know, on the straight path and doing good things. And it just, uh, you know, it's really not, that's one thing that's good about we don't have any problem making songs. There's three of us, we're always oozing with information and uh talking to each other, how do you feel about this, you know, what's, what about that? Oh, yeah, let's make a song about it, you know. Well, you're the poets of the modern age. Right. Well, we hope so. In terms of, you, you touched on it, lyrics. Mm -hmm. You're looking for positive lyrics, but, you know, when I think of rap, I usually don't think, I'm, I'm in that category you mentioned before, mm -hmm. of uh, kind of disruptive mm -hmm. language, uh, discontented language, uh, the, the problems in society down with authority in that. But as you rightly point out, there are different forms of rap. Yeah, well, like I said, since we were raised Muslim uh, and we were rapping, that's what we rapped about. But you have a lot of people who are raised in a lot of harder situations, uh, maybe coming out of a lot of, um, you know, trials and tribulations in their life, and so that's what they rap about. Uh, but we really see our, our form. We know that there's four-year-olds and six-year-olds repeating our lyrics. And so when we write, we don't necessarily believe that we have the freedom to just express about, you know, all of our life's problems and things like that because we know that we're now being role models for others. So I think that's probably the difference. You know, there's nothing wrong with somebody rapping about where they came from. But when you think about how powerful music is and that you will have young kids trying to emulate you and repeating your lyrics, do you really want to be responsible for them, you know, saying yeah, this the, over and over? The, the question is, you know, like is a, is a baseball player a role model? Mm -hmm. is a rock star a role mm -hmm. model. And certainly the way you're describing it, you are an excellent role model. Well, you have to just realize, like I said, the power of the music. You, you can deny it if you want, but the fact is that, you know, for, especially, like you said, sports athletes, there's millions of people looking at you, to what you wear, what you say, you know, how you treat your coach. And, you know, whether you like it or not, that's what you're doing, and, and you have a lot of people who are looking at you. So you know that, you know, Every time we, are, um, we make sure that we dress Islamically and we, we write our lyrics properly because as we, have, we have a burden, but it's, it's good. And I, you know, we all have children, so it's good to have our children repeating the songs and things like that. Do you ever travel outside the country? Yeah, we've been to uh, you know, England a couple of times. We just recently uh, were working with Yusuf Islam, formerly known as Cat Stevens now. He has a record label. And so we performed with him at the Royal Albert Hall in England several times. And uh, we've been to Africa, Mali, Senegal, and Nigeria. And we got invited to Malaysia this August. I don't know if we'll be able to go, but uh, we've, we've been out of the country several times. What would you say to somebody who knew nothing about the Muslim faith and, uh, but wanted to know about the Muslim faith? Hmm. What would you tell them? In, in a nutshell, I, I would tell them that Islam, and, and that's why Muslims, we believe in all the prophets, because Islam means submission to the will of God. So... We believe from Adam, Noah, Moses, you know, all the prophets down, that they were all Muslim because they were prophets of God and they submitted their will to God. Whatever God wanted, that's what they did. And Islam, is that's what that is. Of course, you can get more into the scripture, and, you know, this and that, and how you dress and what you eat and things like that. But in general, that's what the faith is. And that's why it's, it's one of the three major faiths as far as Christianity and Judaism because that's the basis of their religion also is to you know, find out what it is God's saying and what he wants, and then you do that, and you live that. It's refreshing to meet a person of faith, a young person who deeply believes in his religion. Thank you. Thank you. Joshua, for joining us today and sharing us from your heart and your soul. Um, in research on American Muslims, Muslims, our producers came across many who don't necessarily abide by the strictest interpretation of music's place in Islam but do firmly believe in using their faith and talent as a positive force. We'll leave you with a song from one such singer. When I was young, I knew Come a time When I would have to venture on Should I 
stay back? Should I move? Why not try to be everything I wanted to be? Should I go left or go right? 